Welcome everyone to the Deep Dive, the podcast that skips small talk and goes straight for the concepts that shape our thinking and behavior. In this podcast, cold expertise is defenestrated as warm philosophy is enthroned in an attempt to explore the field in which we're all scientists looking for answers, living well. Hello world, welcome to another episode of The Deep Dive with Eyal Shai. My guest today is Martine Ellis. Hi Martine. Hi, how are you doing Al? I'm doing great, thank you. Um, yeah, what is an idea that has helped you live well? I really love this question because a lot of what I write about and think about and do, it is all about living well. So when I kind of kind of distill it down to the the kind of fundamental idea behind what I do I think it is about putting yourself and your needs before anyone else's and I know that sounds a bit selfish when you hear it at first but I think when we dig into the reasons behind it uh, I, I think I'm hoping that anyone listening to this will leave this episode thinking actually no it's not selfish to put myself first does that make sense yeah absolutely so let let us dig into it i mean going back in time is there a place where you can say here's my thought about it and here's the reasoning behind it because presumably maybe that that hasn't always been the case with you mm, yeah definitely um so If I turn back the clock about, I'm going to say 15 years, I'm showing my age already, um, I was uh, working in the finance sector in Guernsey. So I, I, I live in Guernsey in the Channel Islands, which for anyone listening who's, where is Guernsey? It's kind of, it's in the channel between the UK and France. There's a couple of little islands there and I live on one of them. It's a very small community, but one of our, well, I guess our kind of main industry due to tax and things like that is finance. So it's really common for uh, people to kind of leave school and end up working in the finance sector. And in essence, that's what I did. So in my late 20s, I was I was director of a, of a trust company, a finance company in Guernsey. So I, that was a, a pretty big job for someone at the age that I was. You know, I was on a board of directors with a bunch of old suited men. And, you know, I was the, I was the only female and I was in my late 20s, just about to turn 30. And I think on the outside, to anyone kind of looking in, it really looked like I was living my best life, you know. I, I had a convertible, you know, I was driving around in a sports car. I was earning really good money. Uh, I had a corner office, a glass corner office. I had, I had an assistant. I, you know, it looked like I was, things were great. And I guess I thought, you know, at that age, you're like, yeah, you're pretty materialistic, I think. <laughs> you're late 20s and early 30s. I was like, yeah, this is great. And then I, this is going to sound really cheesy and I, I don't want it to, but it probably will. Um, I can remember sitting in my office going, okay, so I have all this stuff. I have this job. Who am I helping? What am I doing this for? It was like a real moment. I don't know what sparked the moment. It just kind of happened. Maybe it was a, I'm going to be 30 thing. Um, and I was, I couldn't answer the question. The, the only people I could think that I, I was helping was, you know, rich people to get richer ultimately. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I'm kind of, I'm kind of buying into something that fundamentally feels a bit uncomfortable. So I had that moment and I decided to just kind of look at what else was out there in terms of possible career options for me. And I don't believe in fate or anything like that, but I, I, if I'm honest, a kind of fate type thing did happen. Like loads, a couple of things happened all all around the same time. As soon as I'd made a little mental switch in my head that, you know, maybe this wasn't right for me and just maybe something else might be right, a few things happened. Um, I was on Facebook because clearly I wasn't that busy in my very well-paid job. And um, there's one of these uh questionnaire things you know that they're like kind of modern chain letters I guess and mm -hmm. one of the questions that a friend sent it to me and clearly like I said I wasn't very busy on the day because I was doing it during my working hours and um, if there was one thing you could do with your career what would it be and without even thinking 
I typed teacher and, and I kind of, I was like, oh, I don't know where that came from, but okay, I'm going with it. I'd love to be a teacher. So that, that happened. Sounds weird, but let's go with it. And then in our local newspaper, I saw that our, um, our local further education college, so that sort of post-16 post education kind of vocational studies, was advertising for uh, a lecturer in office administration, so secretarial skills, administration, business studies type stuff. And it was a one-year maternity cover. And I thought, oh, I could do that, I think. You know, I'd always done, I'd always delivered training throughout my career. Um, and the person on the advert, the contact, was someone I knew. So I was like, oh, I'll, I'll, go, I'll give her a shout. Because it's Guernsey and you know everyone. Because it's Guernsey, everybody knows everyone else. So I did yeah. that. And she's like, oh, the deadline's just passed. You're a few days late. I'm like, oh, can I, is there any wiggle room? And she said, yeah, go on then. Just pop your application. And so I did. And it was a total whim. And I got the job. It was the biggest gamble of my career. Uh, it was a one-year contract for starters. It was a massive pay cut. I was unqualified. I mean, I had, um, I had enough of a qualification to get the job, but I went in as an unqualified lecturer. And that was 14 years ago. And I've never left. <laughs> I'm in a different mm -hmm. role now. But to go back to your original question, the reason that I'm so kind of mindful about putting yourself and your needs first is that my transition in from finance, which it turned out was a really super easy job, and I didn't, I didn't have a clue how easy my work was. My transition from finance into teaching was bumpy, and it was a real shock to the system. And culturally, it was uh, I'd never experienced anything like it. And within my first couple of years of teaching, I got totally burnt out. I was really quite unwell. I had. Um, high levels of stress and anxiety. Um, physically, I was quite unwell. And, and ultimately, I was burnt out. And I found myself in that situation where I was like, well, I love this work. I love this career. How can I do it and be well? And that's when I had that kind of epiphany where I went, oh, I need to put myself first. If I'm not well, I can't help others do well and be well. So it has to start with me. And I started shifting how I did things. So, so that's the kind of long winded way of saying I got to a point of burnout and realized things had to change. Yeah, that, that makes uh, so much sense. And thank you for sharing this story. It does sound like the archetypal um, disillusionment, right? With everything that seems uh, good, that seems um, like it's some sort of peak in your life. And then we know this story from so many other great people who have achieved greatness in a field and something was dead inside. Um, yeah, this is, um, fantastic. And, you know, I think we will get, or I would like to get a little bit philosophical and look at the, at the logic behind putting yourself first and why I completely agree with you. And I think that the work has to start somewhere and how could it ever start in a different place? But I also want to hear from you, um, what was a, a first step maybe apart from the job, because obviously we can take a, another job and be in that capacity, uh, doing better, but that does not necessarily fulfill every other need that we have. So. Have there been any other areas of, of your life, of your maybe um, mental life that uh, you've set out to improve as well? Yeah, um, lots of areas, actually. I think that you're right. It wasn't just a change jobs, realize that this was a struggle and start doing things differently. Um, there, there, there are lots of facets to that phrase, start doing things differently. Um, and, and I, I did, you know, a lot of the things that they, whoever they are, say you need to do, you know, like prioritizing your sleep and trying to eat a bit healthier and, you know, making sure you get outdoors and exercise. So, so I did all of that stuff. Um, I think one of the things that I've been doing recently, so I'm kind of fast forwarding in time, but it, I think it speaks to the question that you're asking, is trying to understand myself a bit better um because in the in the early days I, I put myself first by doing some very basic straightforward things that I, we can talk about and everybody should do but actually really understanding myself on a far deeper um 
level. And and what I'm referring to is actually one one of the reasons amongst many that I got so burnt out so quickly with the level of change that I went through is that actually I'm autistic and I didn't know that I had autism. And so one of the things that I, I I've done recently is I've made steps to get a formal diagnosis of autism and you know to, to people not sort of familiar with with how an autistic person kind of operates it might be like oh why would you want to get an, what, a diagnosis why would you want to know that about yourself and actually fundamentally for me it's been utterly life-changing because I can see why I do things in certain ways and what I need in order to thrive. So an important part of my process of, of kind of getting to where I am at the moment is understanding myself better. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that is, um, that just again makes perfect sense because without understanding what you need to to thrive is like how do you go about doing things and we actually um had an episode on this podcast with um anna Gatt, the founder of inter intellect and the episode is titled uh, know thyself so it's it's been discussed and established as a very important thing to do with your life and i completely agree um yeah i want to say from my perspective a word about the um kind of you first approach. I think that the ultimate goal is, is to live well. And obviously that is a process, right? And the process is something that emerges when, uh, there's sort of a transcendence from the static view of things. So what do I mean by that? I can think of these, um, booklets where, you know, every page is a frame. And there are these amazingly talented people, right? That make movies like that. And on YouTube, you can look like they've drawn a thousand frames or something crazy or more. And they're just giving you that. Well, now each thing is a frame and you can work to like perfect it, draw it the right way. But eventually there, there is a sort of transcendence as it becomes a, a moving thing, right? A process rather than just a still photo. And I think that's a, a good metaphor for a lot of the stuff that we're trying to do because um, a lot of the sub goals in living well are about making sure that one uh, snapshot is like good, okay? So that it fits within the story so that it aids the process, which is going to be coherent and understandable and so on. Um, but it's... It's, it's super easy, first of all, to get distracted. So I think for a lot of us and without kind of any sort of epiphanies and understandings that, that dawn on us, um, first of all, we just draw really bizarre pictures um, consecutively and that doesn't add up to anything and that creates like an inherent dissatisfaction with things. Um, and I'm saying all that because I think that um, to really say there is a me, there is a self, there is an I and others. Obviously, obviously it's something that needs to be transcended at some point. Also for living well, for me, keeping mental health, that is a process and that emerges from sleeping enough, eating right and so on. And it's, it's a process and you can't actually, you don't need to look at the different snapshots after a while because it's just a, a process that you're going. But the really hard part for us is to start the story, okay? Is to have a, a clear idea of what we want this to look like, what the elements are, how to put them together. And once we kind of switch it on, it, it may be easy, but in the beginning, it really doesn't make sense to do it without a conception of self or I. So a lot of people who rush out there and they want to meditate until their self goes away, I think it has its benefits, especially as you're trying to um, climb a well of some sort, like just to get to the, to the uh, surface level from a from a deficit kind of mindset, mm. if you're suffering, if you're in pain or something like that, it's actually very hard to soar by simply, um, obliterating the self without relation to others, just by sitting by yourself. 
And the real way to transcend the self is actually to start engaging as much as possible, not just with others, but with the world at large. But at first, we do have to work with the self first. So that's kind of my technical philosophical way of of talking about it is that um, the interesting part is where you align the needs of yourself with the needs of others, right? That's the key. Uh, but at first, you might need to learn how not to align your actions with actions of others if it doesn't result in well-being, right? Does this at all ring a bell? Mm, yeah, it really does. And and what occurred to me when you were describing your sort of philosophical view on it is the need to be able to look ahead and visualize in whatever way you visualize where you want to be and what you want your life to look like. Um, it's important to be able to do that because I think if you can do that quite accurately, then it becomes super obvious that you need to work on yourself before you know you start working to support others, for example. Um, and it's, it was interesting what you said because something that really leapt out at me was the fact that when you explain it as you did, Al it's hardly surprising that for a lot of people, they have to get to a crisis point almost in order to suss out that things need to change. Um, mm -hmm. and, and in many ways, I think that's what happened to me. I went, oh, this is not sustainable. I can't carry on like this. I can see that where I want to be is the opposite of what I'm experiencing right now. So I was kind of visualizing what that needed to look like. Um, and I still had just about enough energy to start making some changes to get to where I wanted to be. So I, I really like the way you put that. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, absolutely. Another metaphor I could use, you know, is something like a, a squeaky wheelbarrow. You know, the, the, the truth of the matter is that things can kind of run in some way forward and make progress, but that doesn't mean everything is harmonized, right? And then you as a conscious part of some system, you can feel this um, disharmony. And it, it pains us. It pains our soul to just be witnesses to disharmony. It's just not something that we like. And so you can be completely harnessing all your mental powers and so on to make something happen, to push something forward while not being happy and then, yes, you need to disengage in order to re-engage correctly, right? Maybe you want to apply some sort of uh, grease there so that it works well or oil or anything like that. And then once again, you can kind of bring yourself together into a system, into something that's larger than yourself. And then we're always going to have our first person... Um, view and and feeling about things so it can always be broken down into parts and see that yes we are well uh, but in our mind we can always we can start to transcend that and and notice that things are flowing well for us i think a lot of it comes down to and we've, we've said this already so i don't want to labor the point, point too much but it really kind of leapt out of me again when you were you were just speaking then is it comes back to knowing yourself and knowing what you need in order to thrive and so you know personally i need a lot of sleep i like more sleep than most people and i if i'm going to go into a major sort of social busy crazy situation where there is a lot of people and it's kind of high level discussion and noise and sort of visual stimulation and, and that sort of thing. I need time to prepare my energy for that. And afterwards I need some rest time. And I only know that because I know myself and by, you know, knowing those things need to happen if I'm going to be in a certain situation, I'm putting myself first because I know myself but I'm also presenting the best version of myself to the people that I'm going to be spending time with. So everybody wins in that situation. Right. And, you know, it just, it dawns on me that there is something about us that where we're really, um, it's hard to kind of leave that viewpoint that we are makers and we want to make good things. We want to create good things, but we forget that, um, makers still have their own constraints about what actually interests you about what actually 
um, or some other constraints that you have, you know, whether they're physical or mental or just tastes, right? And I think we, we'd like to think of ourselves as, as all powerful and we don't want to sometimes say, oh, you know what? Well, if, if I'm, if I'm only enjoying working with, uh, with clay or doing embroidery, right? It's, this is a sort of constraint because I'm actually limiting myself. I'm admitting to be less than everything, right? But in a sense, of course, as is the case in many cases, like finding the constraints is really key to finding what's actually harmonious in there. And, um, and it's something to be celebrated. Like we're, we're a lot of the times we're actually, um, I just tweeted about this, for example, it's like, I'm not actually understanding what's enticing about becoming very rich. For example, if you have to work hard, because I'm not a hard worker at heart. It's like, show me somebody who's worked just the right amount of time for them and became wealthy enough. I'm not saying rich because rich is, is, is relative to other people. It's like wanting to have more than others, but wealth. Show me somebody who's wealthy while they're healthy and I'll applause that person, right? Um, so I don't know it's, it's just a, a thought. Why is it so hard for us to see ourselves more as, as, um, works of art, so on, where we have our limits rather than being all powerful while in fact, this is exactly the path forward for us toward well-being. Oh, that's such an interesting thought and constraints for me, uh, breed creativity. I, I, I think creates in, uh, constraints in a creative sense, are super helpful. And I'm just thinking, uh, so I, I, I'm a writer and I, I also do some sort of creative art type crafty things as well. And constraining yourself to one particular medium or constraining yourself to a certain word count or something like that, you have to get super creative in terms of, uh, you know, to enable you to create something truly beautiful or something that's really good to read. So I'm actually a, a big fan of constraints. And I think mm -hmm. the, the, the only reason perhaps that we want to have all the things and do all the things and ultimately kind of forget constraints entirely, there's got to be something ego driven there, hasn't there? And, and what our perceptions of um, success look like perhaps. Yeah. And yeah, so to, to take it back to your story, it sounds like as much as we all want to be wealthy, right? We never want to worry about money and so on. But uh, I think the, the more I think about, the more I realize it's always going to be the thing that's nice to have and never the thing that, that is a must have, right? So for you going into teaching, did you recognize that, um, yeah, what, what would be a, a constraint that you've identified at this point? I guess it's the, it's the doing, um, doing good unto others part. Is there anything else? I think, um, going from a job where I kind of ran my day, how I wanted and prioritized things, you know, in terms with my mood and my energy level going into a teaching role. Felt, it felt great to know that I was supporting other, other people, but there are a ton of constraints in there that were really unfamiliar. So for example, I was an expert in my previous role. I knew all the things. I was an expert. I was the person that people came to, to ask questions. In the new role, I was very limited in my knowledge. Um, and you know, there's something strange about being a teacher, an educator, somebody who knows the things when you don't know the things Th that felt really tricky and challenging. And I think the other thing that was a, a huge change was I was working to a timetable for the first time since I was at school. Um, so, you know, when we think about people in an education environment, you know, students, they're working to a timetable, but of course the teachers are working to a timetable as well. So I was like, okay, so you mean I can't just nip out and grab a coffee at 11 o'clock in the morning? Oh, cause I'm teaching. Oh, that, so that, that was, that was a bit of a shock to the system and, and took some getting <laughs> used to, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, but in the end, actually working to a timetable 
became something that helped me manage my energy levels better because it was the same every week I knew what the the cadence of my week was going to be and I I love routine Uh, that's an autistic thing you know routine is is beautiful to me (laughs) the constraints (laughs) of time routine yay um and so in the end it worked out great but it was such a shock such a shock to be the person who was brand new in the role and, and working in this strange way where you had to be in a certain place at a certain time, like every single week. That was weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, 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 that, that is to be expected, but also a constraint and yet uh, p- possibly mm. um, an opportunity to, for, for the whole system to hear somebody asking the naive questions again. And you yes. know, most of them, most of them are probably going to be explained as like, oh yeah, you know, this is this is in um, pedagogic theory. Somebody has asked this question a hundred years ago, and we have a, a good answer why you know this isn't the way to go, and so on. And yet, a complete novice is also able to ask a question where everybody goes is like, oh yeah, let's um, let's consider that, and you know, maybe we don't have the answer to that, and maybe we're now seeing better results in in working with the. Um, working with the children who whoever is being taught so again there's this there's just this always this upside of um of constraints and how they might actually facilitate uh progress yeah i i agree completely and actually you know even though going into this new role um as a unqualified lecturer i didn't know all the things from a sort of teaching perspective what I did know was what it was like to work in industry in in an office environment. So whereas many of my colleagues who were teaching office administration, business studies, etc., they hadn't worked in business for years and years and years. So one thing I was able to bring is a slightly different perspective as in, oh, that wouldn't happen in a modern office. This is how it would work. So there was there's always that upside. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of really your journey with um, taking care of yourself first and foremost, how do you, can you take us on to some station maybe on the way where something new clicked, where it's something that has been neglected before? And again, I don't mean just in the, in the like career change aspect, but Is there a moment where something clicked where you just knew that it's almost like a a level up in a computer game or something like that? (laughs) Yeah, I I can't define like a specific moment in time, but I can share with you um, something that I think is a, a skill that I developed through that kind of journey. And as soon as I started deploying this skill, things started getting better. And the skill was, and it kind of harks back to our talk about constraints, is learning to say no to stuff. Um, and, and that was that was a big, that's a big deal, learning to say no. You, you just, you know, picture the scene, you're a, a, a fresh, unqualified lecturer, you're in a brand new job, you want to say yes to all of the things, mm. all of the the extracurricular responsibilities, you want to do all the courses and you want to do, you want to be work, be seen to be working late because, you know, the boss is walking around and you're new and you want to make a good impression. And, and I, I started realising that, it was not going to be possible for me to say yes to everything. So I I tried different ways of saying no. Um, And what I learned really quickly was it is okay to say no in that work environment. Of course, there are some things you can't say no to, but the optional stuff, it is okay to say no. And by saying no, what it means is you can deploy your yes in, in the right places because there are mm. you know time is there are constraints there and there's only so much you can give so it's kind of a half answer to your question really but I, I think it was an important skill to develop and it kind of came with age and experience uh, to an extent I think in my 20s I would have I was just hungry for all of the shiny stuff and it was yes to everything and I had more energy then but now mm. in my kind of early 40s I'm like no if I say if I say yes to everything, then I'm not giving the best of myself. If I say no to those couple of things that I really don't want to do, then the thing that I say yes to gets all of me. 
No, I love it. It's it's. I don't think it's a it's a half answer. I think it's it's in a sense like um, an emphasized answer, a double answer. I don't know, hundred and twenty percent of an answer <laughs> because because really it's it's so true. I mean, if if yes is yes, I'm going to engage with that, and no is no, I'm going to keep a boundary here. Then this really makes sure, as you say, that when engagement does happen. It happens when it's the optimal time to do it rather than every time, right? So um, for as long as we have uh, a conception of self and we are able to make sure that we keep running healthy and we can engage, then it's it's so, so important, you know? And it takes me also to the, to the place of really having... Um, a sense of confidence in your own abilities, right? And really feeling, which is something very tricky because I think the way uh, our education system works today, the sense of agency is, is really um, something that gets a beating early on and the confidence that I am going to be my own um, autonomous ruler that decides for myself and is able to deal with the consequences of my decisions too, right? So even going very far back in childhood, there's a tendency as parents to want the children to do well. And then the extreme result of that is like helicopter parenting, right? Or as they're called in Sweden, which I love, curling, curling kids, because they're like the stone <laughs> That um, <laughs> the the floor be, be, um, before it gets uh, swept, yeah. so they skate through life, um, and we don't want that, right? We want to encourage people to think for themselves, and this is this is sometimes lost. And the and the no saying I think is so important, and it's something that I personally try to instill in my daughter to let her know that her no's matter and they're listened to. And, you know, I, I will have a discussion with her and, and only in the very extreme cases, I'm going to, to go with what we want, right? Because sometimes it's just not feasible. Um, so I think that's a, a fantastic answer because it's, it, it really explains the mechanism by which we uh, decide whether to engage or make sure that we are safe first, first and foremost. I think it's a, a really hard thing to learn to do as we're so conditioned to be people pleasers. Do you know what I mean? Uh, and yeah. like socially saying no to stuff is generally a bad thing, you know, but you're right when you, you talk about agency. And I do think, you know, there's something to be said for kind of learning, you know, as, as time goes on, there is a Age does play a role here, I think. Um, I, I keep talking about myself like I'm ancient. I'm not ancient, but, <laughs> I, you know, you, you have to practice and try things in order to get become com com confident and comfortable with them. Um, I loved you, you mentioned boundaries, um, and that's an important thing for me as, as well. And I would encourage anyone listening to reflect a little bit on their kind of boundaries. That's a, a very important part of preserving yourself. Um, to give you a, like a concrete example, when I was going through sort of the stress of my work transition and, and sort of heading towards burnout, one of the one of the first things I did kind of after learning to say no was to start putting some really clear boundaries in place between my work life and my home life. For example, not having my work emails on my mobile phone, my personal mobile device. Um, I had a horrible situation where when I was very new to teaching, it was very much the done thing to give your personal mobile phone number out to the students. Um, so just mm -hmm. for context, our students were aged between 16 to 19. Um, and that was done. It was just, it was a sort of cultural thing. You gave your personal mobile phone out uh, number out and I didn't question it. Um, I would, if that happened again, I would question it because I have boundaries around that sort of thing now, but I, I didn't, I was new. And I, and I had a horrible situation where a student um, left the organization and was sending me very malicious texts. And oh, no. I, 
again, I was I was really vulnerable at the time because I was heading towards burnout and it, it became really serious. The police got involved and all that sort of thing. There were really very serious texts. And I look back on that now and think, wow, that wouldn't have happened if I'd had boundaries in place. Do you know what I mean? And the organisation mm-hmm. had um, a role to play because now there are policies and procedures around that sort of thing. This was good sort of 10, 12 years ago. Um, but yeah, boundaries are a really important part of the whole putting yourself first and looking after your needs. And then what did it feel like for you in terms of of your relationship with uh, the system outside you and individuals outside you? Um, Did it feel any different once you were in a place where you were making sure that you are first and foremost doing well? I think there was a transition period where things got a bit uncomfortable. Um, You know, I'll be brutally honest with you. When people are used to you saying yes to everything and not really having any boundaries and you start suddenly speaking up for yourself a little bit and enforcing some boundaries, sometimes that's uncomfortable and it doesn't feel good. But invariably, the people it doesn't feel good for they're probably not the people that you want to be spending all the time with anyway. So it kind of has the effect of showing you who your your people actually are. Um, but people learn quickly. And I think there's an onus on us to train the people around us in terms of how things are, are going to be. And they will, they will do the same to us. This is not, you know, it's not just me. I do care about other people in case, in case that wasn't clear. But we do have a responsibility to kind of train those around us in terms of how things things kind of need to be for us. And then they will do the same for us and we'll meet in the middle. Yeah, I think it's 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 so fascinating for me to think about how how to do that correctly, because it is mm. a skill. And at first, I think we we suck at this, but assertiveness, being assertive and not, and not actually um, going down the path of apologetics and being like, oh, I want it, I, I, I'm going to say no, definitely, because I know what's right for me. But I'm still going to um, try and, and convince you and be nice to you so that in the end, there are no hard feelings whatsoever, da, da, da. And that's just not right, you know? Sometimes you need to um, actually trust the other person to get at that themselves, to understand it, to sit with it, to think about it, and it might not feel great from for them. But again, you're doing what's right for you. And then that's the flip side, which is actually anytime you do something that's good for you, you're doing something that's good for others because you're not um, joining them in their um, harmful activities unto others or unto self, right? And it doesn't have to be like seriously harmful, but that's in a, that's in a sense what it is like putting yourself first. It's, it's more about, well, yeah, I'm, I'm the person that I can control, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. And controlling others is not the right way to go and apologizing and trying to make sure that you're doing the right thing. And yet like this person is going n- not to feel what's uh, bad, badly whatsoever is trying to control them. And it's a kind of manipulation. It's a manipulation attempted at like making the surface appear completely calm and peaceful. So ostensibly that that's a good thing, but it's not. It's just um, kind of putting things under the surface and it's still manipulative. And that's something I had to, to learn in my own life is to actually offer very little explanations of why I act the way I act. Not if they ask me, if they ask me, that's fine, but I'm not going to rush out there and, you know, try to undo the good thing that they just did. That's so true. I I had a colleague um, say to me a couple of months ago that this this year, one of the things she was trying to do was apologize less. And I I really sort of mulled that over and I thought, yeah, that's that's such a good thing to try to do because I knew exactly what she was talking about she wasn't talking about apologizing when she'd done something wrong if that's the scenario then of course it's right to apologize but apologizing for herself and and her way of doing things 
no, you shouldn't be doing that. And I've, I sort of took that to heart. And it's something I've been thinking about quite a lot recently is, is not it's it's about it's like saying no isn't it if you don't apologize constantly when you do apologize it means more it, it's like deploying your yes with care it's a deploying your apology in in the right place at the right time um so is it, yeah i i i need to i definitely need to work on that more um it's it's an important point within what we're talking about i think yeah i mean um in Greek, apologia is simply an explanation, right? So you're trying to mm. give an account. It's it's giving an account, and apologizing is should be giving an account. Like actually saying sorry, saying I apologize, like without understanding what it says, really means very little. Like it it can mean like this very kind of um, dwindled meaning of I understand. Like I'll try not to do that again. But actually, I'd really like to hear from anybody who's apologizing to me the account of what had happened. And we also need to remember about accounts that explanations, if they are not using the terms that the other person is familiar with and is going to agree with us, they might not accept it, right? Because it is like communicating some sort of dogma and expecting them to simply accept it. And they might not you know so it it shouldn't be that one-sided really if if i apologize and i give an account and they completely understand that's good but actually i'd like the person who i'm apologizing to to ask more questions about that to create a meaningful dialogue going forward and that way you can support them to understand exactly what you mean and ultimately it's going to be a richer conversation right so if, if, if your default is to have to apologize to people who are not going to make this into a dialogue, you're actually going to gain very little. Mm, that's so true. Note to self, apologize less. That is going on my to-do list. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and it's not just apologize less, but uh, like you say, like put something into these apologies. They don't, it's not just the story. It's not just the, you know, I won't do this again. I want to hear an account of mm. what was there. And then from there, that's as much as you can do. Then the other person is going either going to be uh, a partner in this conversation, which is even better, um, and have the, the opportunity to, to do that. Yeah. And what we can also say, you know, to the person who we're explaining the situation to is ask me questions. If you don't, if you're not clear mm. on why I'm saying what I'm saying, please do ask me questions. So it becomes that two way thing. Yeah, absolutely. So in, in that sense, like everything we're just talking about is in general, in a sense, you're less, you're doing less running away from difficult spots too. Mm. Right. Uh, whereas the, um, the chronic yay saying to everything and the total engagement to the point of like coalescing into a system or into somebody else's uh, value system or whatever. It's like, yes, 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 yes. It's like, you're, you're one with the thing that's, and if you're too deep into that, that's when you become the type of person that needs a crisis, right? Mm, because yeah. the small problems haven't been solved along the ways they popped up. Now there's just this one all-encompassing problem that needs a crisis. <laughs> that sounds familiar. <laughs> what are some of the other aspects that you find of um, this well-being first or putting yourself first approach uh, when it comes to actual teaching do you think that in teaching is that uh, a less common approach what are teachers like uh, Ooh, usually that's such a good question um i'm doing a lot of reading on the research around burnout at the moment and um the older research interestingly the word teacher normally comes before the word burnout it, you know anyone in kind of helping professions historically have been mm. so so nursing is a really good example uh, so healthcare teaching they've been way more susceptible to burnout because they 
are encouraged it's kind of written into the job description almost that you you give you give all of yourself to this role um so uh, in my experience teachers are not great at putting themselves first because it seems to go against the job description what i didn't mention i don't think at the start of of the episode is what i teach i teach teachers so i'm a teacher educator so I, I am in a really interesting position here because I can see a lot of my colleagues, very experienced teachers, allowing themselves to just get eaten up by the job. I've got shiny new teachers or people who are considering moving into teaching from industry in front of me. And so I have the opportunity and I do push this into my teaching to explain to them that it is a big job you will feel like giving 100% of yourself to it and, and you should give as much as you can. But if you don't look after yourself, you can't do the best possible job that you want to do. So it comes into my role when I'm teaching teachers. Um, the other thing I do in my day job um, is that I work with experienced teachers on their professional development and I can kind of bring in this well-being driven approach to doing your job and being productive in the professional development stuff that I do. So I think to answer your question, teachers are generally, generally suck at putting themselves first in the same way that healthcare mm. professionals will. Um, I will say from a research perspective, burnout is becoming, <laughs> this is a funny way to put it, but way more accessible to people who are not in helping <laughs> professions, um, which is not a good thing. So, you know, you get... Um, uh, Zoom burnout is <laughs> something, <laughs> the uh, um, pandemic burnout, you know, people really struggling with the, the sort of changes that the pandemic brought. There are lots of different types of burnout and it's not just teachers and people working in, in the health profession now. Anyone can be burnt out, which is, it speaks to all sorts of problems, uh, which maybe could be solved by prioritizing our own needs first. Right. Yeah. I know that, um, in tech, that's also very common, yes. like, especially yeah. among coders and people who are just right. kind of, there's no real reason to supply them with any sort of, um, camaraderie or something yes. around them. They're just supposed to be there by themselves and just deliver. Um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting with teachers. Do you think that's true? The burnout thing, even though it was like really old school teachers, the kind of like hard asses that just come there and are very strict or, and, or, or did they have a, a different problem where the children suffered? Is that, is that oh. kind of with the pendulum swing into the realm of like containing a lot and being very soft with the children or something? Mm. Is that an effect of that? Or has it been true of, of like very old school teaching style? Yeah, I, I wonder, and, and given, you know, I've only been um teaching for sort of just over a decade so and my experience is in post-16 education and I teach adults so it's a very different um mm. environment so I can only really kind of use my own experience to answer that question but <laughs> maybe those old school teachers knew something that we didn't in terms of um looking after themselves but obviously the idea of the children feeling the the brunt of that is, is not a good thing um yeah what i would say is that uh, you know i i say put yourself first look after your needs to to try to sort of stave off this this burnout thing but what, what i haven't mentioned is that the organization the employers the leaders and managers do have a significant role to play in this as well um you know when you look at the research what the the things that lead to burnout are when you have massive expectations on you and limited resources so when those you know you could have a job that has high expectations and as long as you've got high resources so things like autonomy um you know the the tools you need to do a role then that works it's when they're misaligned um i'm doing all sorts of hand gestures here forgetting that this is an audio <laughs> podcast but, but it's, it's it's that misalignment um that that often leads to all of these things going badly wrong so as much as i say you look after yourself you can't actually fix all of the problems but what you can you said this earlier the only person whose behavior you can control is yourself so that is the absolute maximum you can do is look after yourself but obviously employers managers leaders do have a significant role to play in this as well yeah, I mean, it strikes me that, you know, in, in your previous career, 
and in this career, you it, it's very different sources of burnout, right? In the first, it's kind of a meaning crisis. And then in the second, it's, it's more like overwhelm that could easily, um, take you, uh, to bad places. And it, yeah, it's, it's very, very interesting to, to explore that and see what can be done. And I think at least in the first with people working in, in finance or tech, you know, what if you like a software engineer, but you happen to work for a company that's just like, you know, and I'm, I'm going to be generous and say makes ads or something uh, like something, like you say, it's just basically creating more money for rich people. And in the worst case scenario, like I have an acquaintance who has gotten very rich because they started, uh, an online legal casino. So something called CFD. Uh, it's not so interesting to get into it, but whether it's something like that, whether it's online gambling, whether it's porn, whether it's any of these like things that are, I can actually be injurious to other people. Um, so that's, that's one thing where you need the, the meaning and then. Uh, as a teacher, it's, it's completely different and I'm, it'd be very interesting for me to think more about how to, to rectify that. And I think in both cases, you want to simply align the, really what the people of a society want, like, so that we all know ourselves because. I think it's a Jim Carrey quote where he says, it's like, I wish for everyone to be very rich, at least for a few days so that they realize that's not the way to go. Right. <laughs> and, um, and I wonder, it's like, anyway, don't, don't really know <laughs> where I'm going with this, but just trying to think about what it says about us as a, as a society that the people doing the, the really meaningful work or the people who really are underpaid. Mm -hmm. and and so on and the people who do the the meaningless work get the money but don't get the meaning it's like how yeah. do we how do we rectify that yeah i know i know exactly what you're saying and it's a it's something i think about a lot certainly i think it became really uh front and center during the pandemic when perhaps naively i, I never truly understood the how important the role of sort of people working in healthcare truly was because I've not touch wood I've not had any kind of major illnesses accidents and a thing like that and and the pandemic really showed us the how hard sort of particularly nursing staff work and then you start thinking about how they are not paid anywhere near as much as they should be and it you know that's just a fine example of of, of what you're describing I guess maybe there's a need to uh <laughs> Re reconceptualize uh the meaning of wealth <laughs> and yeah. and pay people in helping professions a lot more yeah what if we kind of just every year we would find the the budget to give people who think that money will make them happy <laughs> give them that money for at least a while so they see that it's not the answer to everything you know <laughs> yeah know. but what happens it's, when it's they get the money all worked out <laughs> <laughs> no what well, they get the money and they're like no no this is great i'm, I'm quite comfortable with this uh, yeah. i'll keep it thank you very much <laughs> there's a flaw there's a flaw in your world domination yes. plan al <laughs> yes <laughs> yes there is um yeah it's 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 so interesting you know i i hear that in in, in israel now there is a, a huge crisis in, in teaching staff, mm. huge, um, shortages. And now it's like getting to the point where even though as a kid, we would always get this like beginning of a new year strike by the teacher's union. Right. And it always does something, but not really. And it recurs mm. every year. And now that there's a real crisis, you just hope that it actually does something because yeah. It's, it's just amazing, right? That the education of children is not a top priority. It's like, how, how does it work? And mm. it, it, it's just really sad. Yeah, I completely agree with you. <laughs> Have yeah. we solved the world's problems yet? AL? Yeah, we're we getting haven't... there. I think, I think <laughs> by the end of this podcast, for sure, it can't be that hard. 
Um, yeah, what what would be another uh, place to to stop at in your journey towards putting um, yourself first? Is there anything we haven't touched on? I think I've given you the sort of general picture from, you know, career change to learning to be kind of the teacher that I wanted to be. I mentioned my autism diagnosis as well, even though that's fairly recent, it certainly, uh, you know, played a, a big part in this learning about myself and what I need. I think we've pretty much kind of covered it. Um, I guess the only other thing to say is I'm trying to write about this stuff to help other people start thinking about themselves more. Um, it's not a complicated thing that I'm talking about. So sometimes I feel like a bit of an imposter writing about what I write about. <laughs> but some people, I guess I'm kind of giving a bit of a permission slip. I mean, who am I to give people permission? I'm, I'm nobody really. But sometimes it's helpful for a person who's struggling to have someone else say to them, well, look, you know, you do have permission to do this thing, to put yourself first. Are you looking after yourself? Um, I give you that permission. <laughs> Sometimes that, if that helps one person, I'm good with that, you know? No, that's, uh, that's amazing. And I'm really happy that you give yourself permission to do it. And imposter syndrome is, is real. I know it firsthand, but also it's important to remember that each of us is completely unique in the sense yes. of even just what we read and heard in this, right? It's everybody's capable of coming up with metaphors that are totally fresh and are fitting for the times when they are made. Uh, because whatever, we're going to read something about um, the 19th century and it's just going to feel distant. Um, so there's always room for more people writing and it's, it's really good that, that you do this, you know, with me, I personally, uh, I feel strange because I was so, so stubborn, like ever since I was a, a little kid, at least in some respects, like I've always been a, a maverick, um, but not in other respects. So <laughs> I, I never, I never did. I never was part of the population of people who really just go with everything and they are having a hard time to find their own voice in their head you know some people are just walking around all day with the voices of other author so-called authority figures in their life and what this results in is something we mentioned right where you don't have any room for experimentation because it's mm -hmm. not an experiment you you're just constantly thinking about getting the correct outcomes or what these people would have wanted for you or something. And there's never a development of, of, a, of an authentic voice in there. And, and that's so important. So I definitely think that's, uh, that's good work you're doing there. And where, where would it be, uh, published? Is it in book form or something different? Oh, I, um, well, at the moment I'm publishing mostly on my blog, um, which, and I share, I do Twitter threads and things like that. Um, I also write a little bit on LinkedIn. I write for some education publications as well. Um, so I do some sort of paid freelance work too. Um, but I guess like the main place to see my, my stuff is Twitter. Um, I, I quite like the oh, constraints, one of our topics that we've talked about, but the constraints of trying to say something meaningful in, uh, you know, a small number of characters. I, I, I really enjoy that. That's a, a nice creative constraint for me. So, uh, so yeah, that I met like my my kind of online home, I guess, is is my website, which is easy to find. It's martinellis dot com, um, and then you can kind of find all my other handles and stuff from there. But yeah, that's that's where I am. Um, I think there's more writing to come from me in the future. I've I've just finished a master's in education. I've completed my dissertation yesterday. Uh, and so I'm feeling very, I thank you. Thank you. I'm feeling super relaxed right now. Um, but of course the kind of, um, you know, uh, part of my brain is going, what do I do now? What do I do now? Rest, <laughs> Martine, rest. So even I don't get it right all the time, but I'm, I'm going to be writing some uh, daily essays. Kind of, I'm going to have a week off and then I'm going to start writing some daily essays. And I'm thinking, I'm, I'm contemplating exploring how you can use creative activities to prioritize your well-being so um I, you know i like to knit and embroider and things like that and, and i'm really interested in that kind of how that meditative activity helps the well-being side of things i don't think i can knock out many 
essays on that, but I, I might fiddle around with that and see where that takes me. Oh, that that sounds fascinating. So if you needed any encouragement, then you, you get it from me now. And I was going <laughs> to say to people listening, if for some bizarre reason you've been listening for an hour and still being kind of, oh, this is really not very good. There's not much here. <laughs> well, then at least uh, go on Martine's Twitter and look at her embo- embroidery. It's going to make <laughs> it all worthwhile. Um, oh. I highly recommend that. And it's, oh, that's it's, kind. it's wonderful. So you are clearly not a one trick pony. <laughs> well, I just, you know, the embroidery thing, I just like, I do like learning new skills and really kind of getting getting into them. And the embroidery thing just, um, yeah, just kind of happened over my summer break. But if ever, anyone does want to find me on Twitter, I'm Martine Guernsey on there. And I would love to strike up some conversation about your creative skills and how you prioritize your well-being. Absolutely. Well, Martine, this has been a, a great pleasure. Thanks for coming on the podcast. And sharing your um, journey and insights with us. Ayal, it's been my pleasure. I've really enjoyed chatting to you. Thank you for having me. Thanks so